I'm Keith, and today we're going to carry on uh, taking a look at uh, microeconomics. Today our goal is to take a look at the fundamentals, our key concepts, uh, kind of why we even study microeconomics, or what rather the study of microeconomics even is. Uh, that's our goal today. One kind of thing to kind of think about as we start off is, what's the cost of you being here? Uh, many of you will kind of come to this and be like, well, okay, that's a pretty dumb question. Clearly my cost of taking this course is the tuition, uh, maybe the time that you're putting in, but uh, we want to think about this kind of idea of cost a little bit differently. And that is, as we think about this idea of cost, what are you giving up by being here? What is that next alternative that you could be doing instead of being here watching this video? Instead of doing all the coursework that is going to be going along with this video? That there turns out to be a pretty fundamental, pretty big idea to do with economics. And that's going to be this ultimately, the idea of opportunity cost, a big idea that we'll flesh out as we carry on today. But again, something just to kind of keep in your mind as we start off. So jumping over to it then, what exactly is the study of economics? What are we looking at as we get through this course? Well, ultimately what we're interested in in economics is how you make your choices, right? And all all through your life, every day, you make choices. And the question is, well, why? Why do you have to choose between A and B, right? Why can't you have both? Why can't you have everything? We have near unlimited desires, but despite these unlimited desires, we can't satisfy them all. We have to choose between, well, do I get a coffee or do I get a cookie? Which one do I choose? And why do we have to make this choice? Well, ultimately, the big reason is because we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity, that maybe is a new word for some. What exactly does that mean? Uh, what we mean by scarcity is that we have limited resources. There are only so many. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of the problem we have here. We have near unlimited desires or wants, but we have limited resources available to us. So, okay, we want everything. We only have so much available to utilize. How do we best utilize the resources available to us in order to maximize our joy, our satisfaction, whatever it is that we, whatever outcome we're trying to achieve. Uh, next, as we carry on to the next bit, is we're gonna be taking a look at the seven principles of economics. So these are big kind of things, is what we witness in the world around us, or some what we witness in the world around us, some big assumptions we make of how economic agents, that is, you and I, individuals, how these economic agents are assumed to behave. Let's uh, jump over and take a look at that. So our first principle of economics here, people face trade-offs, right? But one of the big famous things that we say often in economics is that there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? You, just, you can't just get something for free. We have these scarce resources because there's scarce resources, you have to make choices between A and B. And that is even if you choose to have this lunch, well, by choosing that lunch, you've given something else up. Everything has a cost, and that cost is always in those trade-offs. One of the big costs, one of the big trade-offs that we look at as a society, and this is something that will come up frequently as we go through this semester, is this idea of efficiency versus fairness. Right? This is one of the big trade-offs that we have, one of the big trade-offs that our governments end up getting involved in is we often can achieve efficient outcomes. Um, we often, as in economics, are concerned with or really wanting to ensure that efficient outcomes happen. That is efficient outcomes because we can be sure that these scarce resources that we have are used in the most efficient manner possible. We're not leaving anything behind on the table. The problem is an efficient outcome is not necessarily a fair outcome. I would argue here the big thing is that efficiency is more the focus of economics, where fairness is more the focus of politics. The reason why this is the case is because fairness always comes back down to fair for who, right? In each case, if I try to make something more fair for one party, it's going to be seemingly less fair to another. So efficiency versus fairness is often one of the big trade-offs that we face. Getting back to the question we asked at the start, right? What is the cost of being here? And as we were saying, easily it's to say, yeah, that cost of being here is my tuition. 
that time that I'm giving up. Um, but really what we want to get at here is that cost of you being here is that next best alternative that would have been available to you. So you're watching videos, you're doing the work all together, let's say in a typical week for this course, you're giving four to five hours to this course. Okay, that's four to five hours that you're not getting back. What could you have done instead of this? Could you have worked? Well, if you could have worked, you're giving up that many hours of work. All of this to say is that by choosing to be here, the cost of being here isn't necessarily just your tuition, but your cost of being here is your opportunity costs. Let's write this down. This is a pretty big idea here. The opportunity cost. And that opportunity cost is that next best alternative that we have given up. Let's take a look at this a bit of a different way, not necessarily in terms of this course or your tuition or something like that. Let's suppose that we have, we have a scarce resource. We have a dollar. So, okay, we have a dollar and we're a little bit hungry. We go to the vending machine and in the vending machine, we have the option of buying a Reese's Pieces. Let's make that a little bit bigger so we can see that. There we go. You can buy Reese's cup here or we can go and we can buy a Twix bar. We'll suppose that both of these guys cost a dollar and we can pick whichever one we want. Question is, if we decide to take this and we take this dollar and we go and we use it to buy a Reese's Pieces, what is the cost of this? It seems like you're like, okay, well, Come on, Keith, the cost of buying a Reese's Cup is that dollar. That's the price of the Reese's Pieces. What are you talking about? Well, okay, no, 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 no. This, this dollar is our scarce resource, right? We only have one dollar. We have two wants. We have the Reese's Cup and the Twix. So, okay, limited resources, much more in our wants. Limited resources, unlimited wants almost in this case. This causes us to make some choices. We have to choose, do I want the Reese cup or do I want the Twix? In this case here, as I go through this, the cost of choosing one over the other is my opportunity cost. That is, if I choose, if I were to choose to take my scarce resource and use it to buy the Reese cup, I have given up the Twix bar. And in this case here, my opportunity cost of buying a Reese's cup my opportunity cost is this four gone Twix, that next best alternative. So that's our idea of opportunity cost. Not necessarily cost of an item is not how much of the scarce resource we gave up to get it, but rather the cost of an item is that opportunity cost, that next best alternative that we could have had, but we gave up in order to pick the item that we have picked. Okay, so we're, our first two principles were more of observations of the world around us, right? We observe that people make trade-offs because we have this world of scarcity causing us to make choices. We then get that second principle, which is that we have these opportunity costs, and that is the true cost of an item. Our third principle is more of an assumption, right? And our third principle is really that we are going to assume that economic agents, again, economic agents, that is you and I, that is businesses, an economic agent is anyone who is engaging in an economic activity. So really that's anyone. And so what we're going to assume is we're going to assume that economic agents are rational people. We make a farther assumption with this, and that's really the assumption explicitly stated here. And that's that rational people think in the margin. So, okay, let's get into this. Rational, margin. These might be some words that are new. These might be some words that are a bit ambiguous to some. Let's take a look at what exactly we mean by this. Let's start off with this word rational. What do we mean by rationality? What do we mean by a rational person? Well, what we would say by rationality, we would say that a rational person is somebody that systematically and purposefully, right? So very planned, 
is going to do their best to achieve their objectives. So, okay, maybe that helps, maybe that doesn't. Well, what this means is that whatever your objective might be, so let's presume you're a consumer, right? Which most of us are. Let's presume that our objective in consuming is to maximize our satisfaction, right? We want to consume something in order to feel satisfied, in order to get some kind of utility from that consumption. So in this case here, if I am rational, I'm going to choose my consumption in such a way that I'm getting the most benefit, the most satisfaction from that consumption, right? Keep in mind, I have scarce resources. I only have so much income. I only have so much time to go out and go buy stuff. So I can't just go and buy stuff just freely. Woo, go and do it. No, no, no. I have to have a plan. If I want to get the most out of the stuff that I'm buying, the most satisfaction, I need to have a purposeful idea as to how I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy this. I'm not going to buy that. So that's what we mean by rationality. What about this next idea? What about in the margin? Does that mean that, well, our economic agents, they do all their thinking over here on the edges of the paper? No, 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 that's just silly, right? But really, margin does mean edge. And so what we mean by margin is that we do our thinking, we do our decision making right on the edge in these incremental changes. So to give an example of this kind of marginal thinking is we may go out and we might may buy ourselves a full large pizza. But very rarely do we sit down and we say, I'm going to eat that whole pizza, right? That's typically not a plan that we have. Instead, we may buy this whole large pizza and then we have a slice. And then after that slice, we go, yeah, you know what? I'm still hungry. There's still some satisfaction that I can have if I have an additional slice. And we keep doing this, right? We make these marginal, these incremental decisions to have one more slice, one more slice, until finally we get to that point where you're like, you know what? I'm happy. I've had enough slices of pizza that if I have another slice, I'm probably not going to get any satisfaction from it. In fact, we may have been here. If we get another slice of pizza, I might even get dissatisfaction from it. Right? You're just, you're so full. You're like, why? Why did I go for that extra slice of pizza? This is our marginal decision making, that incremental change from one slice to the next. Very rarely whole pizza right now, but rather slice by slice. If we wanted to be nitpicky, we could even break that down farther. We could break that down to bite by bite. There might be a few of you out there where you're like, yeah, I'll have half a slice of pizza. And then I'll be like, yeah, okay, that last bite, I was happy with that. I'm done. I didn't finish my slice, but that last bite was that incremental change that left me at my last, left me at a point of complete satisfaction where I, I shouldn't go for any more. So that's what we mean by marginal decision making. Next few principles here, I'm going to get through a little bit quicker. Um, there's not too much more to elaborate on them. Uh, this next one, principle four, people respond to incentives. Hopefully this one should be pretty clear. Um, you're going to respond to an incentive. If I were to say, hey, do you want to come do something? And I would just say, just because? Let's say it's some kind of activity in the classroom. And I'm like, hey, I need some volunteers for this. Typically, we have a lot of people looking at their shoes. We have a lot of people not really wanting to be engaged. What if instead I change that up and I say, okay, I need some people to come volunteer for this little project we're going to do, this little experiment we're going to do in the classroom. And anybody who volunteers is going to get an extra percent added to their midterm grade, just a bonus mark. Well, now all of a sudden I don't have everybody looking at their shoes. Now I have people going, hmm, maybe that's worth it, right? So here, just by offering an incentive, Individuals have responded. Individuals have been willing to change their behavior based off of the incentive offered. Maybe a percent, plus one percent on the midterm grade, maybe that wasn't enough of an incentive to get very many students to get engaged in the experiment. Maybe it was, right? Depending on what the goal is, depending on what the objective is, maybe we need a greater incentive in order to encourage participation. 
Maybe not. Ultimately, the big takeaway in this, though, is that incentives are powerful. And incentives are what we respond to. And especially as we get through this, we'll see price incentives, price signals are that key kind of signal that we respond to in our decision making process. And something we'll see as we carry on. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. This one's a great one. Uh, this one here, I know that instantly a few of you are gonna be squirming in your seats going, I don't know about that, Keith. I see there's a lot going on. There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of argument. What about all those poor people in the US who are very upset because of all the international trade going on? I mean, we have big political movements right now just to restrict trade. How can you go and say this as a principle? Well, we have a whole chapter devoted to trade. We'll spend a lot of time looking at trade and showing how it is actually ultimately better for everybody. Trade is not zero sum. It's not one party wins, one party loses. Trade really does make everybody better off. And for now, just to kind of leave you with this, think about it this way. What would a world look like without trade? And in fact, maybe what's even better is to have you think, what is trade, right? And it's easy to kind of take about what is trade and to jump to that whole international trade kind of situation. Now, yes, international trade is trade. But it starts to get blurred, it starts to become abstract because of all the politics, different currencies, different cultures, all of that associated with it. End of the day though, trade is trade. So in a very simple way, you go to work. You are trading your labor for a wage. You want to go buy groceries. You are trading some of that wage for the food that you buy. All of that is trade. So let me ask that again. What would a world look like without trade? Say you needed a new sweater, right? Winter is coming. It's going to start to get cold. You're like, yeah, I better get a new sweater. I better get a new coat. Where are you going to get that from? How are you going to get that new sweater or coat in a world without trade? Keep in mind, a world without trade, you can't just go to the store and buy it because that is trade. So in this case here, where does that come from? You have to make it. And not just you have to make it, you can't just buy the raw material to make it. No, 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 you have to grow or produce that raw material yourself. So we see here, every little aspect of your life, something as easy as making a peanut butter sandwich all of a sudden becomes exceptionally difficult to do in a world without trade. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight as to what we're talking about with trade. And hopefully just with that simple example, you can see that, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe trade can make everybody better off. Principle six here, markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. But what do we mean by this? What's, what's a market? Well, a market is where people come together, where economic agents come together to transact, to be able to take their scarce resources that they've collected, that they've turned into goods and services, and to be able to exchange them between each other. Now, this is actually a really interesting one because in our day-to-day -day life, we almost take this for granted. But think about it this way. Have you ever gone to the grocery store to buy some bread and actually just stopped for a minute to think about that? To be amazed that there is actually bread there for you to buy. Have you ever asked yourself why? Why is there bread there for you to buy? Did some government authority plan to make sure, hey Keith, I know you want some bread today, I'm going to make sure there is a loaf of bread there for you. Did the baker, is the baker someone who's concerned about me? Right, the baker's up at night concerned, oh man, I hope Keith has some bread tomorrow. No. No, no, no. I don't know the baker. The baker doesn't know me. In fact, the baker has no care for me or anybody who the baker is selling the bread to at all. In fact, who does the baker care about? The baker cares about the baker. And what we witness in these markets, in these markets, we have this decentralized decision-making happening. 
It is all of these economic agents, the baker coming together for the baker's own interest, me coming together to buy bread for my own interest. And in this way, as we all come together acting in our own self-interest, we have almost an organized chaos. And this organized chaos results in an efficient outcome for the use of these scarce resources. All of these resources that need to go in into making that bread. In this decentralized way, in this market, by everybody acting in their own best interest, we have this almost survival of the fittest scenario that enforces, makes us have efficient use of our resources. So in this way, free markets, these decentralized markets with no one big power overseeing it or able to manipulate it, they are a great way to organize economic activity and they are typically an efficient way to organize economic activity. Principle seven, sometimes government can improve market outcomes. Uh, this is, this kind of one seems funny, right? It seems like we're backtracking here. Uh, principle six, we just said that free markets were the best markets. These decentralized decision makers create the most efficient outcomes. And then now we're saying, hey, sometimes if we have a big government come in, that's not a decentralized decision maker, that's a very centralized decision maker, we can actually improve the market outcome. We can actually improve efficiency. So, okay, which one is it? Well, it turns out that sometimes we have what we'd call market failures. Uh, market failures, that there is when the market, when the market fails to achieve an allocatively efficient outcome. That is, it fails to allocate all of our scarce resources in the most efficient way. Some situations where this arises. Uh, the two situations which we arise, and don't get too caught up on them now, we have full chapters looking at them later. These two situations that we look at are externalities and market power. Let's start off with market power because it's the simplest one just to wave our hands at. With market power, it's when we don't have a strong decentralization of our decision making in a market, but rather we have one or a few very large buyers or sellers. That is, whenever we have an economic agent who is able to influence a market outcome, they have incentive to influence it for their own gains. In this way here, it's going to create an inefficient solution. So market power, first cause of market failure. This is going to be one we actually spend a lot of time looking at as we carry on through the course. The other one we mentioned there, an externality. An externality is any case where an, economics, an economic agent's actions have either an external cost or an external benefit, which is incurred by society rather than the economic agent themselves. So what exactly does that mean? Right now we can look at a situation very apparent in the world around us, given that we're living in this case of COVID, it's why we're delivering online. Well, let's talk about the wearing of masks. So in the wearing of masks, if you didn't know, the big thing with a mask is that it prevents the transmission from you to others. That is the primary reason to wear a mask is for other people to receive a benefit not necessarily any benefit for you. So here's the problem. A rational individual acting in their own interest looks at it and goes, hey, if I'm wearing a mask, it's entirely cost to me. Maybe it's uncomfortable. Maybe it's hot. Maybe it's a little bit difficult to breathe or more awkward to breathe. And wait a minute, by wearing a mask, I'm not even protecting myself. So what's the benefit that I get from this action? Well, what we see here is now this economic agent is incurring cost, receiving very little benefit. They're not going to be enticed to wear a mask. This is a problem because from a societal perspective, we get societal benefit if people do wear masks, but the individual agent is not going to want to. In this way here, we have again a market failure. We have role for government or for a big centralized power to come in and mandate it in order to say, Yes, you don't get benefit from wearing a mask, but society does. And so in order to ensure that we have an efficient number of masks being worn, an optimal number of masks being worn, we are going to mandate 
and improve this market outcome by putting in rules and regulations to require the wearing of masks in certain situations. So in this way here we see that yes we can have market failures, that decentralized actors at times can fail to achieve an efficient outcome and when this happens we potentially have room for government to step in and room for government to allow for an efficient market outcome. Okay, last little thing to cover here is the distinction between a normative and a positive statement. Uh, this is important because normative statements can be tricky. Um, they're often used to kind of try to push a certain belief or a certain view. Um, where positive statements, these are more of our fact-based statements. These are ones that are empirical, they can be measured, they can be proved, and they can be shown. So again, kind of um, glazed over that, a normative statement is our value-based statement, our belief-based statement. Uh, they're not necessarily grounded in fact. Good kind of keys to find out if something is normative is it's typically a comparison, like, ah, this is too high, well, should it be? There's another one, should, ought to be, different things like this, things that are expressing a value or a belief are a normative statement. Meanwhile, positive statements, these are ones that are grounded in facts. So what something is, uh, something that can be measured, something that can be pointed to and shown to be the case. So doing a quick look through a few examples here. The first one, the unemployment rate is 10.2%. What do we have here, normative or positive? Well, in this case here, this is a measurement. This is something that is measured and estimated through Statistics Canada. And we have the estimate of unemployment at 10.2. So that is a positive statement. Next one there, current house prices are too high. Well, current house prices are too high. That's going to be a value-based statement. Uh, too high with respect to what? What should house prices be? Right? If we knew, if we could say house prices should be X many dollars, well then yes, we could say that they are too high. But it turns out it's quite difficult to nail down and say that, hey, they should actually be a different price and currently it's too high. So as a result, that whole bit there, that's an opinion, that's a value, that's a belief, that's a normative statement. So first two there, an example of each one. Hopefully that kind of sets straight the difference between normative and positive. Next three there, I'll let you guys take a look at that, figure out, work through, is that normative, is that positive? If you have any follow-up questions with this bit, with any of the other parts of this video, either comment below, comment on D2L in our frequently asked questions, or feel free to ask me during the office hours and I can hopefully clarify a bit of things for you. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you next time.